Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. So for announcements, uh, we have our final exam on Tuesday, May 9th. So next Tuesday from 7.30 p.m. until 10 p.m. Uh, plus the 30 minute grace period. And so the exam will cover all topics of the course. It's cumulative, but it will emphasize op amps through the end of the course. Because if you work op amps through the end of the course, you still have to use KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, all of those great things we learned early in the course. Um, so see the schedule PDF file on Canvas, and that has a list of topics that uh, you can review. There are also review problems uh, on, on the website. There are practice problems. So click on the practice problems link that will take you to some problems that I created. And then we're going to start some review problems today um, and those slides will, will be posted online, uh, as well as some slides that I will present at office hours today. So if you'd like to stick around for office hours and go over some problems, I'm going to present some review problems. Um, stick around after class and we will do that. And let's see, um, what else? So the exam will have three or four problems, probably four problems. It will be longer than the regular exam or the exam one or exam two um and but but it won't be two and a half hours long so that doesn't mean don't study it means you should study but you uh you i think you will have plenty of time to work this exam i don't think there will be uh, lots of time pressure for that okay so uh, again office hours will be right after class except i'm going to use office hours for um a, a review session and uh, we'll work problems there. All right. So last time we talked about stepper motors um, and before that DC motors. So I talked about DC motors. Uh, you apply power, the motor spins, you can control speed with pulse width modulation. You can call, control direction. My camera's doing something funny here. You can control direction uh, using uh, an H bridge. And for a stepper motor, you had to, you have to control it in a little more complicated way where you have to energize phases of the motor or windings in order uh, such that you have the motor spin at whatever speed and direction that you want it to. And you can stop the, the motor at any step along that process. You can precisely control angle. Um, today, we're gonna finish up motors and finish up the topics for the class with servo motors. Okay, so let's talk about servo motors. You might have run into these if you've uh, worked on uh, remote control uh, cars or aircraft. So a servo motor um, is, is a device used to precisely control linear or angular motion. So you might have seen these again on, on RC cars or RC aircraft, and they range from these very low torque applications to models that have very high torque for industrial applications. And so what I want to do is take one of these smaller servo motors and break it apart and talk about how they work. So here is an, a block diagram of this small servo motor here. Okay, this is like a like a hobby uh, servo motor or or something for a small application. You can see the shaft here, the case, and the, the wires coming out. There are three, um, three sockets here for, for pins. And that wire goes to the motor controller. So let's take a look at this block here. Um, this is how a servo motor works. There's a motor controller that provides power to a, a DC motor. So this motor can turn either direction and the speed can be controlled uh, using pulse width modulation or, um, or the voltage applied to it. This DC motor connects to gears. So there's a gearbox here. And that gearbox uh, is, is a reduction gearbox such that the output shaft spins much more slowly than the uh, DC motor shaft. So that's where you take off the, the torque from the servo right here, that's the shaft right there. A shaft is also connected to a potentiometer. And so that potentiometer, uh, the resistance of that potentiometer varies 
as the output shaft turns. Okay, so you can map the position of the output shaft to the potentiometer's position. And if you create a voltage divider using this potentiometer, as you saw with one of our examples, as you turn the shaft of the potentiometer, um, you get a voltage that varies, let's say between zero volts and five volts. So now you can map that voltage to the position of, of the shaft, okay? So that's, um, that's useful. Now you, you have a shaft position sensor. And so that position a voltage is then sensed by the motor controller. Okay, so that's, that's how the motor controller knows the position and can control the DC motor. Now let's look at that interface, these three wires over here, these three nodes right here. You have uh, a power input, like five volts, a control signal and ground. So the control signal gives a command to tell the motor controller a specific position. And so the motor controller can determine the difference between your commanded position and the actual shaft position. And that provides an error. You, you calculate an error for that. If the shaft position is exactly on the, the, um, uh, uh, the commanded position, then there's zero er error. The motor doesn't have to move. But if that error goes positive or negative, the, mo the motor controller determines, well, should I have apply a positive or negative voltage to this DC motor to turn it in the correct direction to reduce that error to zero. That should sound familiar. That's negative feedback, right? That's what an op amp did in the circuit. The op amp uh, uh, minimized the voltage error in quotes. That was the input differential voltage to the op amp. So it minimized that error um, uh, um, by feedback from, from the output of the op amp. Well, that's, What's going on here? There's an error, an error voltage that is the shaft position minus the commanded position that creates a voltage that drives the, the DC motor, that turns the gears, that moves the output shaft to the commanded position as sensed by the potentiometer. Okay, so a servo mechanism in general uses um, feedback to achieve a desired result. And that desired result can be position or speed. So that's a general servo mechanism. A servo motor, like you see here, typically controls the position of the shaft. And then you can set the desired position uh, using this control signal, that input right there. And of course, the, the motor needs power in order to run. So that's what, the, and the electronics need power. So that's why there are uh, three uh, inputs here, power signal, uh, control signal, and ground. And then negative feedback minimizes the difference between the actual position and the commanded position, okay, just like I described. So that is, that's how a servo motor works. Uh, there's a commanded position, a sensed actual position, the motor controller turns a motor one direction or another or stops it to minimize the error to make it zero. I think it's interesting to open up one of these and take a look inside because you can recognize components that you might have seen in lab. So uh, this is, here's the DC motor here, right? That's a DC motor connected to gears. These gears are geared down to turn this shaft with an arm on it. That shaft um, is connected to this potentiometer back here. You can see the three wires that are connected or the three terminals here with three wires connected to those terminals, right? So you apply power ground, and then there's the wiper that gives you a, an output of a voltage divider. That voltage divider tells you the position, tells the motor controller the position of the motor. And then there's some electronics here in an integrated circuit that, that take the uh, control signal and compare it against the actual position and then turn the motor. So apply either a positive or a negative voltage to these um, terminals here and you have a servo. Okay, so you can see the motor controller here. You can see the DC motor from the block diagram to the actual uh, unit, the gears, uh, the potentiometer, and that's basically what uh, a small servo motor is, and you can extrapolate that to a big servo motor that has similar motor position sensing and controller. So what is this control signal? It's actually a pulse width modulated signal, 
like we've talked about before, but used in a different way. So this would be a typical small servo motor control signal. So you apply power, you apply ground to this connector, and then for the control signal, you apply pulses. You can apply these pulses from a function generator or from a, uh, uh, a microcontroller, for example. Okay, so um, the typical rot rotation range of one of these small motors is 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And you, you vary this pulse width between one millisecond and two milliseconds typically to control the motor rotation, the angle of that um, servo motor, the shaft uh, over that range. So you use pulse width modulation to control the angle of that servo shaft here. And typically the period is 20 milliseconds. That's a 50 Hertz uh, pulse train. And then the typical pulse duration is one millisecond to two milliseconds to control the, the servo over that full range. And you can use a microcontroller to do that. So for example, if I want to, let's say this is a servo motor that can be controlled over 180 degrees. Um, if I set the pulse width to one millisecond, then the, the shaft moves to zero degree angle. If I go to one, uh, one excuse me, 1.5 milliseconds, you'll get uh, um, halfway to 180, 90 degrees. And if I set the pulse width to two milliseconds, I'll go all the way to 180. And then linearly in between, you'll have angle adjustment. So that's how a servo motor works as an overview. So you, you can use one of these in, in, a, in a project um, and you can pick these up pretty cheaply, like in the kind of $10 range from uh, online sources if you want to use one. But the key points I want to make here are what, what the servo motor does and how to distinguish it from, let's say a servo, uh, how to distinguish the servo motor from a stepper motor. Um, because you have to actively control both, and how to distinguish it from a DC motor, because, well, a servo motor contains a DC motor. So servo motors use a control signal and negative feedback to position a motor shaft. Okay, and, and again, it has a DC motor, but in comparing a servo motor to a DC motor, servo motors use a pulsed voltage to control position. In other words, pulse width modulation to achieve a specific shaft angle. DC motors, on the other hand, uh, use a pulsed voltage, pulse width modulation, to control speed, not position. Okay, so you use pulse width modulation to achieve a specific speed. All right. And in comparison to stepper motors, which also have to be actively controlled with something like a microcontroller. Servo motors, um, the shaft angle is controlled by using closed loop control with negative feedback to achieve a position. Whereas a stepper motor shaft angle is controlled by energizing phases or coils within the motor, and then you stop at a certain position. Okay, so you have to know the position and then, and then stop there. So those are the comparison points I wanted to make between servo motors and those other motors. But the big takeaway, the takeaways from, from this motors survey is DC motors, you can control speed and direction. Um, stepper motors, you can precisely control speed and direction, um, but it's a little more complicated to, to control those. And then if you need, um, you know, just control over a, a certain range of angles, like 90 degrees or 180 degrees, you can use something like a, uh, a servo motor or a servo to, uh, to do that. All right. Okay, any questions on any of the motor topics that we've covered so far? Okay. Nothing heard, nothing seen in the chat. So um, I'm going to put up a clicker problem now. This is an easy clip, clicker problem. It's a survey I'd like to do. 
and you will get credit just for answering this. So, so this class has been um, remote for a few semesters now, and I like to ask how it's going. So now that you've had this class in the remote version, the remote form, if you could go back in time, right, uh, and choose, would you like this class to be remote via Zoom, which means Zoom lectures like we're doing now, uh, the lectures would be posted, are posted and recorded with office hours being held via Zoom, um, or in a lecture hall, in, in a lecture hall, so that would be classroom only. We've tried recording, you can't really see the whiteboard when I write on it, so that, so I don't typically post record those lectures. You can just hear me talk and you can't see anything I'm writing. So there's no recorded lectures and office hours would be held at some other time than, than right after class in, in, um, in a, you know, an office. So I'm curious if you would, I'd love your response to this. Um, if, uh, you know, because you've gone through it, you've taken regular classes, you can compare them. And so would you, would you recommend keeping this uh, class remote via Zoom or would you rather have it uh, in a lecture hall? All right. All right. Looks like I've got everybody's answers here. Uh, so take 10 more seconds if you haven't answered yet. All right. All right. Well, thank you for those responses. And I do appreciate the feedback. All right. So let me bring up a slide here. Okay, just just a reminder of what we've been through. So we have actually finished the course topics. We covered the circuits portion of the course, right, right way in the beginning of the semester, went through basic electrical theory, DC analysis, RC circuits, first order analysis, and phasers. And then we moved on to what I called the electronics part of the course and really applied what you learned during circuits to real components, talking about diodes and transistors for making rectifiers and electronically controlled switches. We talked about op amps for making amplifiers and other circuits, right? For, for let's say amplifying a voltage from a low voltage to a high voltage, from a sensor to a data acquisition device. Um, we talked about op amps for comparators. So you could make a, let's say a thermostat we talked about digital systems and digital logic to make circuits that uh, can make a decision for you. And then microcontrollers and gave a brief overview of, of ports and peripherals and what you can do with those. Finally, we got to motors and servos and, and DC motors are pretty easy. Power them, use an H bridge to control direction, use pulse width modulation to control speed. And then if you want to control stepper motors or servo motors, you can use something like go back to microcontrollers to create the signal that can control those um, and control precise angles. There are a couple other topics. We're not going to get to those. I usually leave those just in case there's uh, a lecture at the end of the course, but so we're not gonna cover sensors and applications uh, live, but I will send out a link on Canvas to uh, lectures if you're interested in those. Um, and you could watch those. These will not be, sensors and applications will not be on the exam. So you don't have to watch those, but you're welcome to. Okay, so we, I think we achieved what I expect to be the objective in this course, getting through finally to mechanical topics like motors and servos. Um, and so what I wanna do now is uh, start some final exam review. So I'm going to do these review problems in the form of clicker problems. I can get this up there. Okay, so 
this will be the start of the final exam review. And so these are the emphasized topics. Remember that we're going to cover, I mean, naturally, these later topics cover the earlier topics in the course. Um, but the exam will emphasize uh, operational amplifiers, op amps. Well, we covered linear circuits using op amps, like the inverting amplifier and the non-inverting amplifier. We covered comparators, circuits that can make a decision or they can tell uh, which voltage is higher at two inputs. Okay, we, uh, we talked about digital uh, electronics and digital systems. We talked about numerical data and how to represent binary values and how hex values can represent binary values. We talked about combinata combinatorial logic, making decisions using gates in a circuit and taking a truth table that you can define and creating a circuit that implements that truth table. We talked about microcontroller concepts and ports and peripherals like analog to digital converters and how you can, you can get uh, values into a microcontroller to use and how you can output values from a microcontroller to control things like motors. We talked about electric motors, um, uh, DC motor control, uh, direction control with an H bridge, speed control with pulse width modulation, uh, stepper motors you can control by energizing coils, and servo motors with negative feedback of a controller and a DC motor. And then we're not going to cover the sensors or the regulators on, on the exam. Okay, so let's move on to the first review problem. So if you have this circuit, so you have this circuit, um, V in is two volts, what is V out? Give that a shot. I'll give you a hint here. This shouldn't take too much analysis. It shouldn't really take any analysis. Remember the decision tree. You ask yourself, does this circuit have negative feedback? If it does have negative feedback, then, um, then you go down the left side of that tree that I had, right? And it's either a common circuit or you use negative feedback analysis techniques for an op amp circuit. You shouldn't have to use analysis techniques for negative feedback for this circuit. So that's, that's a big hint. All right, let's start talking about this. So this circuit does have negative feedback. How do I know that? There's some connection between the output of the op amp and the inverting input. The inverting input is the one with the minus sign next to it. Okay, so that's the inverting input. So there's some connection. This circuit does have negative feedback. The first time we saw the circuit in class, we wrote a Kirchhoff's current law equation at this node I'm circling here. And we found the relationship between V out and V in. And then we named this amplifier. It's called uh, an inverting amplifier, or a non, sorry, non-inverting amplifier. And so V out is the gain times V in. And in this case, right, looking at the circuit, the gain is one plus 4K, which is the feedback resistor, um, to, uh, divided by 1K, which, which is this resistor to ground times V in. That's five times V in, so the answer is 10 volts, okay? And how do I know this is a non-inverting amplifier? Just because of the connections, just because I have a resistor going from the output to the inverting input and a resistor going from the inverting input to ground, V in is applied to the non-inverting input, 
V out is taken off of the output of the op amp. Just, just because those connections are made, that's why this is a non-inverting amplifier. All right. Any questions on this problem here? Well, we will do a few of these op amp problems. All right, let's go on to the next problem. So here is another op amp problem. You have this circuit. V in is four volts, so I'm applying uh, four volts right here. What is V out over here on the right? So a hint is, I would recognize this as a common circuit. So we have talked about the gain of this circuit, the voltage gain of this circuit. All right, let's start talking about this. So this circuit does have negative feedback. It has some connection between the output of the op amp through a resistor to the uh, inverting input. Okay, so this, this is negative feedback. The output voltage can influence the input differential voltage. That's what you need to have negative feedback. Okay, so this is either a common circuit or I have to analyze it. Well, I recognize the circuit. I think this was the first one that we analyzed by, again, writing a KCL equation um, for the currents at this node or here, okay? And when we did that, we determined this was an inverting amplifier. And an inverting amplifier has uh, a gain of minus the feedback resistor divided by this input series resistor here, okay? And so um, the gain is minus two over eight, which is minus one quarter. So you get minus one quarter times four, negative one volt. All right, any questions on this problem? All right, let's do some more op amp problems. So here is another op amp problem here. So take a close look at this. Um, it's kind of drawn in a weird way. Ask yourself, does it have negative feedback? And if it does, do you recognize the circuit from its connections? So give that a shot.
All right, let's start talking about this problem. So this circuit does have negative feedback because there's some connection between the output and the inverting input through that 12K ohm resistor. So that's the feedback resistor right there, that 12K ohm resistor. And so I also see this 3K ohm resistor that goes from the inverting input to ground. And then it looks like there's some load resistor out here at the output to ground. Well, if, if you look at these connections closely, you'll notice you could redraw that same circuit like this, right? Here's the feedback resistor, the 12K ohm feedback resistor connected from the output to the inverting input. The, so it's the 12K ohm, the 3K ohm resistor goes from the inverting input to ground. And then I have an output resistor, a load resistor here. And VN is applied to the non-inverting input. Okay, so that should be recognizable as a non-inverting amplifier whose gain is one plus the feedback resistor over that resistor to ground. So you have a gain of five. So the voltage gain is five. All right, any questions on this one? We'll keep rolling through a couple more up amp problems. So these slides will be posted. The video will be posted. Also, these slides uh, will be posted on Canvas, so you can take a look at these, work through them if you want to use them as practice problems. Okay, how did I determine the question in the chat? How did I determine one plus um, 12 over three? So if you look at this um, redrawn schematic here, I identified this as a, uh, a non-inverting amplifier because of the connections. And, and so you could see we, the first two op amp circuits that we solved for the gain were the inverting amplifier and the non-inverting amplifier. So that's, that, that should be in your notes and you know, a video on that if you wanna check that out, you can derive that. But once you derive the gain of this circuit, you find that it's one plus what we called R2 divided by what we called R1. Okay, so when I wrote a KCL right here, I get one plus R2 over R1 as the gain. That was the relationship for V out over V in. And so in this case, R2 is 12 K ohms and R1 is three K ohms. So that's how I got that. And if you forget, if you say, I don't, I don't recognize that as any common amplifier, you can always just solve for the gain by following the negative feedback uh, procedure for solving for the op amp voltages and gain. So you assume, if you see negative feedback, you assume the input differential voltage between the inputs is zero. You assume because op amps have high impedance inputs, you assume zero amps into the inputs. And then you write KCL, KVL, Ohm's law, whatever you need to, to get the value you're looking for. In this case, I wrote a KCL equation here at the inverting input node. And I got an equation that said V out equals something times V in. And I could figure out the gain from that. All right. Okay, let's try this one. So this problem, um, I don't recognize this as a common circuit. So what you might do is take a little time and maybe copy this circuit down and start writing down what you observe about the circuit. I'll give you, I'll give you like, you know, a few minutes to solve this, but I do see negative feedback here. Um, but I don't recognize this as a common circuit.
All right. Let me switch over to the whiteboard here so I can incrementally write this solution. Okay, I should have not put it all the way on the left, but I did. So we're going to deal with that. Okay. So if I start writing what I know here, I have negative feedback. There's some connection between the output um, of the op amp and the inverting input. Okay. Um, and so let me just start writing what I know here. I know there is negative feedback. So I have zero volts between the inputs. I know I have zero amps into the inputs of the op amp because op amps have high impedance inputs. So two milliamps is going down to ground here. I can always connect grounds together. So you always assume all grounds are connected together. You can do that. And then I have, so I have two milliamps coming down. I have no current going into the input of the op amp. So I must have two milliamps going this way. Right, which means I have two milliamps going this way. So I have two milliamps going through a 4K ohm resistor. And by Ohm's law with that polarity, I have eight volts, two milliamps times 4K ohms. Okay. Um, since I have zero volts between these two nodes, Right. That means these two nodes at the non-inverting input and the inverting input, those have the same potential. So if I have a node voltage here of negative 10 volts, that also means that I have negative 10 volts node voltage at the inverting input node, right? Because there's zero volts between those two. So that means that between this node, right, this node here and ground, I have negative 10 volts, right? So I filled in a lot of voltages here. I think I can write a KVL equation to determine VO, which is over here. So let's try to go through VO and find a path, write a KVL equation, find a path that has all known voltages at this point. I know that voltage, right? And I know this voltage across the current source. Back to the start. So my KVL equation would look like this, minus VO, minus VO, plus eight, plus a negative 10, equals zero, back to the starting point. Right. So I get VO equals eight minus 10 equals negative two volts. All right, let's go back to the back to the screen here. See if I got that right. Okay. So here are those values that I wrote on the whiteboard. And it looks like I got that right. So the answer is negative two volts. All right, any questions on this problem, right? That's a good, this is an old exam problem. That's a good exam-like problem there. Um, I have a question. Sure. Do we have to write out the KVL or can we, knowing that leftmost node voltage, just add eight volts? Well, I would claim you're doing a KVL when you do that. Um, if, if you want to do it in your head, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. You know, I think what you're doing is you're, 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 equating, you're equating the node voltage of this node, right? Because that's the V, v naught. And, and you're saying, well, that node is also if I go up negative 10 and I go up eight, I also get that node voltage. So you can do that, but I, I, I recommend 
well, always write down your work, whatever you're doing, but I recommend doing the KVL equation. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, I was a bit confused because if you're gonna do a KCL at the node um, on the negative part of the op amp, mm -hmm. um, I got a different answer because it was basically 0 0.002 plus negative 10 minus V naught over 4,000, which got V naught equals six volts. Let's see. So you have, oh, did you write a KCL yes. equation right here? Yes. Okay, let's try that. Let me go back to the board and let's try that. Let's see here, where'd my zoom go? No, that's that's another good way to solve this, I think. Let's let's give it a shot. So let's do this. Let's rewrite that bigger so I can make bigger notes on here. Okay, so. Okay, so so you know that this voltage here, this node voltage is negative 10 volts, right? For this upper left node here. And so you're going to sum this current with this current and this current, which is zero. And this is plus minus zero volts, zero amps ramps. So sum these three currents and set that sum equal to zero. So let's do that KCL. So the current, I'm going to sum currents leaving this node. So current leaving this node is two milliamps. It's called 0 0.002 like you did. Right. Uh, the current leaving into the op amp is zero. And the current leaving this way, this current is minus 10, this node voltage minus this node voltage minus VO over 4,000. So plus this current, or this voltage minus this voltage, node voltage, this node voltage minus this node voltage over 4,000, minus 10 minus VO over 4,000 equals zero. So if I multiply both sides of this equation by 4,000, I get eight plus negative 10 minus VO equals zero. So I get VO on the right side equals eight minus 10. So I think I still think I get the same answer. Is that what you got? Yeah, I just, yeah. What tripped you up there? I'm curious, which- I um, accidentally multiplied 0 0.02 by 8,000 instead of 4,000. Ah, that'll do it. <laughs> Good. I just want to find the source of the problem. All right. Any other questions on this one? All right, let's try this one. Let's see, once I put it on the screen. All right, give this one a shot.
All right, let me, uh, since we're bumping up against the end of class time, I'll work through this problem. This will be the last, the last one, and then we'll call the start of office hours. So let me bring up the whiteboard here. Okay, so we have the circuit. Um, I see negative feedback. There's a connection between the output and the inverting input. That means the input differential voltage is zero. And because op amps have high impedance inputs, we have zero amps going into the input here, both inputs. Um, I see, and I just start picking apart this problem. Like, okay, I have negative six volts source here connected to ground. That means the node voltage of this node is negative six volts, right? Since there's zero volts between these two nodes, this node on top is also negative six volts node voltage. They're gonna be the same because zero volts between them. Uh, what else can I figure out here? I have, a voltage across this 2k ohm resistor with this polarity, because that's a node voltage of negative six volts. Ohm's law says I have, um, let's see, uh, negative, what is it going to say? It's going to be six divided by two, negative three milliamps. That's milliamps, right? Or positive three going up. I have negative three going down here by Ohm's law. So I have, I could write that like this. I have three milliamps going up if I like that better. These are the same. So I have five milliamps coming into this node, three milliamps coming into this node, zero going into the op amp. So that means I have five plus three, eight milliamps going that way. Across that resistor, I have eight volts. So you just keep, just keep picking at this, right? Until you get Lots of values where you can find a, a path, uh, like a, a KVL path, KVL loop, or KCL uh, node, where you have only one unknown. You can connect all the do that. Do that in blue. Connect the grounds together, right? And I think I have. KVL path I can do. I can start here, cross V out, cross that known voltage, cross that known voltage, get back to the starting point. So my KVL looks like this. I'm, 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 not, I'm not crossing that six volt source. I'm, I'm going along this blue line here, the ground line, jumping from here to here, minus V out minus eight, minus eight, plus a negative six, back to the starting point, equals zero. So V out, moving to the other side, equals uh, minus eight, minus six, minus 14 volts. All right, so bring that back to the, screen here. And okay, so that means, yeah, okay, great, got it right. Minus 14 volts is, is the output voltage. So um, if you have any questions about this, um, again, I will post these slides and we're gonna continue this at office hours right now, but just in case you have to leave, I want to not go too far over class here. Don't forget that the exam is on Tuesday next week. So that is May 9th from 7.30 p.m. until 10 p.m. plus 30 minutes if you need extra time to submit. So this is closing out the regular lectures and this will be our last real, real lecture. And so when I started this class, this course, you know, I, I said I, I really hoped to um, strengthen your ability to analyze and to build and to measure and to understand circuits. So I, I hope that you've seen through these lectures, through the homework, through the labs, 
that you've ha you've got a greater understanding of um, circuits, right? Circuit analysis and electronics, and also your ability to use components like uh, uh, diodes for building rectifiers or transistors for controlling current, um, or op amps for building amplifiers. Um, you know, I hope that you've got a, a better familiarity with. Uh, digital concepts like digital numbering systems and how you can take a truth table and define it yourself and then create a circuit that makes a makes a decision using combinatorial logic. Um, and then also uh, um, how microcontrollers work uh, uh, basically and that they have ports and that they have peripherals like analog to digital converters and um, and how you might use the digital ports to control motors like stepper motors or, or servos or the H bridge to control the direction of a DC motor. Um, and then I, I definitely hope through lab that you've, you've got your hands on circuits, that you built circuits, that you use the test equipment, that you learned something there and that you, you gained some troubleshooting skills, just, you know, circuits never work the first time. And so what do you check? How do you, how do you debug your circuit? And so I hope, I hope that was apparent in your work there. And then overall to give you building blocks of electronics that you can apply to test and measurement or you know, instrumentation or control in your mechanical engineering career. Um, so I hope that all happened. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that, again, there's a course that I'm teaching in the fall um, on some more topics like that. So thanks for joining the live class. Thanks for taking the course. Um, uh, uh, you know, I know you have choices on circuits courses, so I'm glad you took this one. I'll start office hours uh, in just a few minutes if you would like to join. So if you'd like to join, please do. If not, I'll see you at the final exam. Have a great night.